Thank you for coming on this rather dreary, I guess it's not really quite spring yet, but hope springs eternal, so we can think that winter is at least in the waning stages of its uh, sort of rather dreary self. I'm Alan Stam. I'm professor of government and coordinator of Dartmouth's War and Peace Studies program. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the Dickey Center for International Understanding for providing support for this program and many others like it. In particular, I'd like to thank Ken Yalowitz for his ongoing support and assistance. Ken is the director of the Dickey Center. The War and Peace program has been able to sponsor and support numerous events like this over the last couple of years, and much of that is facilitated by and made possible through Ken's generosity. As we contemplate the facts before us, that the United States is currently involved in wars on multiple continents and has troops deployed to over 100 countries, it's sometimes helpful, for me anyways, to remember that the 20th century was one of remarkable achievements, and both achievements in science and technology, but also achievements in human progress. 20th century was also one of repeated and staggeringly costly wars, however. Over and over and again, under the cover of war, both planned and inadvertent killing of civilians and abuse of civilians, one group by another, has taken place. In World War I and World War II, the ideas and tools of the industrial and scientific revolutions were harnessed for the destruction of militaries, but also countries and peoples. In the so-called Great War, more than 8.5 million people died in battle. There were unknown millions of civilian deaths, in addition to the state-sanctioned genocide of more than one million Armenian people by the Turkish government. Woodrow Wilson, at the time President of the United States, called World War I the war to end all wars. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. Two decades later, Adolf Hitler, in planning the elimination of six million Jews and five million gypsies, homosexuals, Poles, mentally and physically disabled persons, and other non-combatants remarked, who today speaks of the Armenians? All told, some 30 million people died during that war. Since 1945, state-sponsored mass killings and genocides have taken place in many regions, including Cambodia, Guatemala, Rwanda, Yugoslavia. In the past 10 years, over 3 million civilians have died as the result of war between and within states in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. In many of these wars, the United States and citizens therein have either been directly or indirectly culpable in the suffering of millions of civilians, or as others rather euphemistically refer to them, non-combatants. The phenomena is not, as some would suggest, disappearing. Most recently, the Bush administration and its prosecution of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan has moved to employ torture as a coercive means to extract information from both combatants and non-combatants alike. In our desire to make ourselves more secure, it seems that the process does indeed inflict an enormous cost on humanity. This afternoon, it is a great honor to have with us a panel of some of the nation's foremost experts on the human costs of war, the human cost of violent conflict. They are both practitioners and scholars in the finest sense of both words. Kathy Alden, Carolyn Mackison, and Sharon McDonald. This afternoon, each of them will speak to you for about 15 to 20 minutes about their particular area of expertise. Then we'll open up the floor to questions. Our first speaker is Carolyn Mackison. She is the Executive Director of the Women's Commission for Refugee Women and Children and Senior Advisor to the Mellon Foundation Population Program. The Women's Commission is an advocacy organization that works to improve the lives and protect the rights of refugee women and children worldwide. It is an independent affiliate of the International Rescue Committee and was founded in 1989. Her previous position was the Director of International Studies at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Before joining MIT, Mackison was Program Officer for Population and Forced Migration at the Andrew Mellon Foundation, where she is now a senior advisor. In that role, she was instrumental in the creation of programs to bring reproductive health services to refugees and in generating a stronger focus on the needs of refugees and women. She's also worked with Macro International as a country monitor for Burundi and Kenya 
as well as as a research affiliate with the American University in Cairo. Mackison has won numerous academic fellowships and prizes and has published widely as well. She received her PhD in sociology from Princeton University. Have a welcome. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. I'm, I'm very honored to be here. Um, I'm not great on PowerPoint. This is only my second expedition with this technology, so if I need help, I shall uh, hope that somebody can show me how to do it. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Should I? Is that better? I wonder if I can. I think it is on, actually. Is, is that all right? Is it just that I can't get close enough to it? Excuse me. Sorry. The sound engineer in the back is trying to raise the volume. Can you hear me now? I, I sound a bit like the uh, Verizon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is, is that all right now? Can you hear me now? That's okay. I think that's okay. Can you? Fine. Okay, I'll start. Uh, anyway, I'm honored to be here. Um, and I was asked to speak on the impact of war on women and children. Um, I'm going to do that through the lens of the Women's Commission for Refugee Women and Children. Firstly, because um, that's what I know about. Um, I'm not an academic, so I can't give you the state of the art on a particular area of research. Um, and what I know about really is, is perhaps how to apply um, academic research and advocacy. Um, and the second reason I'm going to talk about the Women's Commission's work is that I think when we contemplate the terrible things that happen to people in war and its aftermath, it's good to know that there are some things that we can do about it. Perhaps not a big fix, but I think there are some things that we can do. Um, and I shall talk about some of those. Um, as as the, um, the introduction mentioned, the Women's Commission was established in 1989 under the auspices of the International Rescue Committee. Um, it's an advocacy organization. We, we're not operational. We don't provide services to people in the field. We try and find issues that will affect the lives of women and children um, and um, conduct advocacy to change policies and approaches um, that we think will improve things for them. And we also house a program called the Watch List on Children and Armed Conflict. Um, the aspect of war I'm going to talk about is the mass displacement that results from war. Um, and that often continues for years afterwards. Um, first of all, I'm going to provide some background information so that you'll have some context in which to put the, the more specific um, issues that I'll address. Um, I'll talk something about the major risks for displaced and war-affected children drawing on the watch list reports, um, a little on education and emergencies, and I'll also touch on a couple of issues that most affect women. Um, just to give you a sense of the numbers involved, the estimates for 2003 were that there were nearly 12 million refugees and asylum seekers, um, nearly 24 million internally displaced population. That's people displaced within their own countries. Technically, refugees have crossed a border. Um, so the total number of displaced people in the world is about 36 million. Um, when the media focuses on crises, we tend to see the immediate crisis while the war is going on of the very short-term effects. And what we don't see um, is the very long-term nature of displacement that results from conflict, that children often spend their entire childhood, in some instances, their entire lives, in situations of displacement. Um, the worst effects are often among those who are displaced within their own country, and we hear less about them. They're often more inaccessible, their own government is often responsible for their plight, and there's a lesser involvement on the part of international humanitarian organizations. Um, just to give you a sense of this, um, the first two populations, the Palestinians and Afghans, are refugees. Um, and you can see on the right-hand column, the year since outflow began is really the point of this chart, um, that millions of people are involved, and that you can see that some of them, you know, have been in these um, situations for 10, 20, um, 50 years. Um, another um, characteristic that I think is less known is that a large and growing number of the displaced live in urban slums. They don't live in camps. Um, according to UNHCR, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, 18% of persons of concern to UNHCR worldwide lived in urban areas in 2002, up from 13% in 2001, 
and just 1% five years earlier. So this is a new phenomenon. Um, the official number in 2002 was 2.4 million for refugees. So that doesn't include the internally displaced and those who don't seek recognition as refugees. Um, having given that kind of background, I'll now move to um, the findings of um, the watch list um, on children and armed conflict. Also, I should say that I'll leave um, a set of publications here so that anything I mention, um, you, you'll have a sort of um, book of it if, if you'd like to explore it later. Um, the watch list compiles information and publishes reports that document the effects of war on children's lives in specific geographic areas. It includes in the reports practical recommendations aimed at the UN Security Council, UN agencies, other international agencies, national governments, and the general public. So far, Watchlist has produced nine country reports. And that shows the, they've just been going since 2001. No matter the setting, Watchlist found that armed conflict had a remarkably similar effect on children's lives. Um, and I'd ask you to bear in mind three things. The very high proportion of the population that are children in these settings. For example, in developed countries, 17% of the population are aged under 15. Um, but in developing countries, that's 33%. And in many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, um, probably 50% of the population is aged under 18. Also, don't forget the slide I showed you earlier about the duration in which children um, suffer these kinds of abuses. And again, um, the fact that those displaced in their own country are often the worst off. Um, watch this most recent report is on Nepal and was launched in Kathmandu three weeks ago. Um, an expert, uh, uh, an ex I'm going to read an excerpt from a speech at the launch that was subsequently published in the Nepal Times, um, days before the king, as I'm sure you all know, disbanded the government. And I'll just read this because I, I found, found it was very moving and I think in a more qualitative sense will give you a picture of what the lives are like for these children everywhere even though this was on Nepal. <coughs> Many of us have childhoods free from fear or intimidation. A childhood where we go to school, play with friends, meander in the fields and innocently dream of our futures. Childhoods full of calm, confidence and enthusiasm. Yet many of these qualities of childhood are being taken from the children of Nepal. Their childhood is disappearing. This beloved country, known for its peacefulness, seems to have lost its way. Nepal has gone into a wilderness of war, fear, and betrayal. Today, instead of eager students finishing their high school, youth are clothed in khaki and carrying guns. Instead of studying at homes in the evening, they are reciting lessons of ideology and dogma. Instead of playing with their friends by their local schools, Children are forced to work as porters for armies of the night. A country where one could walk tranquilly in the hills has become an armed encampment, where homes are shut tight in the evenings and villagers dread a stranger's knock on their door at night. In communities throughout the nation, naive and vulnerable children are taken against their will to the jungle for political indoctrination or taken furtively in the barracks to inform on a relative or friend. Um, I'm now going to um, outline the main risks um, confronting displaced and war-affected children that were identified in the watch list report. Um, and I'll leave copies of these reports, as I mentioned. Um, so these are the major risks. Um, I'll talk over this. I know it's a rather small, crowded slide. But um, um, health hazards, and I think that both Sharon and Kathleen are going to go into more detail on these topics. Um, epidemics of childhood diseases are more common, nutritional prog problems, um, that um, war obviously leads to a destruction of health infrastructure and makes it very difficult to rebuild. Um, as an example, in 2002, it was estimated that 76% of Angolans did not have access to any form of health care. Um, Landmines and cluster bombs are a risk for years after peace um, and repatriation. Again, as examples in Afghanistan, Human Rights Watch estimated that nearly 5,000 unexploded bomblets from US warplanes were littered across Afghanistan. Um, they're often bright yellow in color, and so children um, think they're toys. Um, in Angola, um, there are an estimated two to seven million landmines and unexploded ordnance. Um, births are not registered so that children have a lack of identity um, and other documents that make it difficult once um, 
the situation becomes more peaceful for them to gain access to education and other um, institutions. Um, there's a lack of education in Congo, for example, about 50% of children of primary school age do not participate in the educational system. Um, in Sudan, less than 30% of school aged children in southern Sudan are enrolled in schools, and in some areas, it's as low as 15%. Um, in Nepal, Maoists have actually attacked schools, abducted children and teachers from schools, and um, requisitioned schools as barracks. <coughs> Um, the psychosocial impacts I know that Kathleen will be talking about, um, and these I think are exacerbated by the lack of education which provides a kind of structured um, situ setting for, for children. Um, a study in Angola estimated that 81% of displaced children had experienced combat violence, and 56% had watched someone trigger a landmine, and one can only imagine what that does um, to children. Um, children also become separated from their caregivers um, in times of kind of chaos and conflict. Um, and tracing and reunification, even if it's successful, often takes a very long time. Many children end up living in child-headed households with children trying to take care of younger children. Um, and abuse and exploitation is the, is the final thing that happens to children. They're separated from family protection. Many of them end up living on the streets. In Sudan, for example, more than 30,000 children are, are thought to live unaccompanied and unprotected on the streets of Khartoum. Um, they're recruited as child soldiers, and this applies to girls as well as to boys. Um, in Angola, the Coalition to Stop the Use of Child Soldiers estimated that 7,000 children um, had been recruited in both government and opposition armed groups. Um, in Nepal, up to 30% of Maoist forces may consist of boys and girls under 18 years. Um, trafficking is also um, a consequence of, of war and displacement. Um, Colombia's Department of Security reported in, in 2000 that the country is one of the three biggest sources of trafficking victims in the Western Hemisphere, with 35,000 to 50,000 women and girls trafficked abroad in that year. Um, and a lack of livelihoods um, also leads to child labor and to commercial sex work. Um, I thought I'd mention a few success stories. You'll see that they may sound like a drop in the ocean, but things that resulted from some of the watch list reports. Um, in Angola, child protection advisors were included in the US peacekeeping operations after the publication of the report. In Colombia, local organizations used the report to get changes made to the national child protection law. In Congo, communities used watch list as a model to establish their own local child protection working group. And they disseminated information on local radio and TV stations. Um, and in the Sudan, at a major um, donor conference just after the launch of the watch list report, there was a significant shift in dollars that were allocated to children's issues. So I think it's important to recognize that, that we can't solve all these problems, but I think we can do something about them. Um, Another area that the Women's Commission has been involved in recently um, is education. And um, the Women's Commission produced the first real survey of what was happening or not happening um, in emergencies in terms of providing children with education. Um, the main findings were that more than 27 million children and young people affected by armed conflict did not have access to formal education. The vast majority of these children were displaced within their own countries. They were not refugees. Um, the schooling that is provided is almost exclusively in the first two grades of primary education. And we can see that children spend their lives. So we're going to have, even if there's a chance for peace, um, children who've had virtually no education at all. Only 6% of refugee students are enrolled in secondary education. And that's even worse for the internally displaced. Um, the schools that exist are very overcrowded, cover large age ranges in single classrooms, have poor infrastructure, and lack educational materials. Um, and there's a very strong demand for education among refugee and displaced communities, so this certainly isn't due to a lack of interest on their part. Um, and we are hoping to um, build an advocacy <coughs> campaign on this issue in the near future. And now I'll turn briefly to um, issues that affect women. Um, until 10 years ago, um, and these are 
um, publications that, um, of which I'll leave a, a copy here. Um, until 10 years ago, the reproductive health needs of displaced women were almost completely ignored. I must say, when I found this out, this was how I ended up working in the, in the refugee field. I just found it astonishing um, that there was no family planning, even though we can see that these situations go on for years. They aren't just short-term emergencies. Um, very little assistance with deliveries and none for obstetric emergencies. No provision to deal with unsafe abortion or miscarriages. No HIV AIDS education and prevention programs or diagnosis and treatment of other sexually transmitted diseases. And no supplies at all for menstruating women, which is quite a problem in these settings. And I think this is part of a, a, of a sort of mindset that I think is slowly changing, that displacement is short-lived and chaotic. And I think that same mindset underlies the lack of educational programs. In 1994, the Women's Commission produced the first report on the lack of documenting the lack of services and the need for them. And 10 years later, in 2004, a comprehensive evaluation has just been published. And there has been a tremendous change, which I think shows that we can improve things. Um, the main findings were that basic reproductive health services are now available in stable camp settings, largely. Um, that we're still not doing very well in the emergency phase, where there is a special approach um, that's, that can be adopted and is much being slower to be adopted. Um, and that, as in so many instances, the internally displaced are very poorly served in comparison with refugees. Um, and then the, my final topic is sexual and gender-based violence. Um, I think the attention to reproductive health led the way, really, to dealing more broadly with gender-based violence. It drew attention to women's issues. Uh, we know that sexual and gender-based violence has been a long-standing component of armed conflict. We know um, that Korean, Indonesian, Chinese, and Filipino comfort women were ens enslaved by Jap the Japanese army during World War II. That hundreds of thousands of Bengali women were raped by Pakistani soldiers, soldiers during the partition of British India. And we know right now um, that um, sexual and gender-based violence is being used in Darfur um, as a way to force the population to flee. Um, it's important to note that this is um, organized and systematic. It's carried out as publicly as possible to ensure humiliation and demoralization of entire communities. It isn't just random acts of violence by armed forces that are out of control. Um, even when women reach international protection, they're not safe from sexual and gender-based violence. Um, I'm sure many of you have read in the newspapers recently about um, what happens to women, for example, in Darfur when they go out to look for firewood. And this is something that's repeated over and over again in these kinds of emergencies. And until the last 10 years, I think it was largely treated as an inevitable consequence of war. Other forms of gender-based violence that are exacerbated by war are early or forced marriage, domestic violence that is thought to increase in post-conflict settings, um, forced or coerced prostitution and other forms of sexual exploitation, and the trafficking of women and girls. Um, and again, I think that things are beginning to happen and that we can do more. Um, I think the reproductive health movement has made a direct contribution to drawing attention to this issue. Um, there are now protocols for tre treating um, victims of rape if we can reach them soon enough. Um, there's attention to camp organization, like the placement of latrines and water, even if I'm afraid that we still haven't solved the fuel and firewood pro problem. Um, we need to make sure that laws and procedures provide adequate protection for women, that training uh, is provided for those responsible for their safety, like the police, international peacekeeping and security forces, and the judiciary. And that we also, um, in these kinds of settings, conduct community education and, and prevention programs. Um, so thank you, and I'll be happy to answer questions later. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Let's see if we can... Does your, is this the first slide for you? It is. Yeah. That's for Sharon, not me. For Sharon, okay. They don't have your names on them. Pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> 
see those together as a thing. Voilà. Our next speaker today is Kathleen Alden. She is assistant professor of psychiatry at the Dartmouth Medical School and lecturer in the Department of Social Services at the Harvard Medical School. She is also the medical director of the International Survivors Center in Boston, a program that offers mental health, legal and social services to refugees, asylum seekers and victims of torture and human rights abuses. Dr. Alden works with the International Rescue Committee to develop training initiatives in international mental health and psychosocial humanitarian assistance for refugee and war-affected communities in Africa, Asia, and elsewhere. Her expertise involves cross-cultural psychiatric assessment and mental health care of highly traumatized victims, asylum seekers and survivors of war, mass violence, torture, and other forms of extreme human rights abuses. She's worked in refugee camps and makeshift hospitals evaluating and treating hundreds of victims of torture and mass violence. In 2001, Dr. Alden was invited by the United Nations High Commission for Refugees both to serve as a U.S. delegate to the Stockholm International Conference on Resettlement and Integration and also to present the conference's plenary section, session lecture on the special needs of highly traumatized refugees. She is the principal editor of the United Nations document Manual on the Effective Investigation and Documentation of Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman, or Degrading Treatment or Punishment, known as the Istanbul Protocol. Kathy? I'm, I'm afraid Al overstated my work with the IRC. I wish I worked that much in collaboration with them. But um, in today's lecture, uh, I'm going to be talking about interventions, and in honor of our guest uh, the w uh, from the Women's Commission, I will be highlighting some of the examples of psychosocial interventions by using illustrations from the International Rescue Committee's work, which I think does some of the best groundbreaking work in this area, really in the world. Uh, the reason I decided to include interventions in this talk is because about a couple weeks ago, I was called by National Public Radio to, to discuss with them uh, in view of what was happening in uh, Indonesia and elsewhere due to the tsunami, what, ac what one can actually do for people who are suffering in, uh, in the aftermath of major disasters. And it occurred to me that this is something we don't, as a general rule, know much about in the general public. So I want to include that in today's talk. So I'm going to begin by uh, this is what we mean by psychosocial. It may seem inherently obvious by reading the term itself, but believe it or not, this is a sort of uh, mysterious term in, in the field of humanitarian assistance, and there's much debate as to how one uh, defines it, how one uh, measures the outcomes of psychosocial programs, and how one um, decides when the work is over, and I'll get a little bit into that today. Um, I'm a psychiatrist, as Al mentioned, and so my, uh, my orientation has been sort of a biomedical one, and really one has to wear a different hat when, dis when uh, working in humanitarian assistance in that the numbers are huge, as Carolyn pointed out. You don't do psychotherapy or psychoanalysis on millions of people. So what do you do? Um, on the other hand, major disasters affect one's uh, mental uh, life, one's emotional life, as well as one's social relationships and ability to support oneself. And it's that dynamic inter interaction between the psychological and social that I'll try and help you understand a bit. Uh, keeping in mind, uh, uh, though I'm from the medical school, distress and suffering are not illnesses. They are normal reactions, and we tend to medicalize, and my field is over-pathologized um, effects of trauma, and one, you're all <coughs> familiar with probably post-traumatic stress disorder. But when you experience violence, we have all natural capacity to adapt and be resilient in the, in the setting of, of disaster and trauma. Some of us develop disability and psychological disorders. And so how do you assess this? Uh, the best approach is a multi-level approach. Uh, we use personal testimony, 
ethnography, the work of anthropologists and human rights activists. My most comfortable area, of course, is the clinical, medical, psychiatric modality. And then there's epidemiological uh, studies that are very important in this field as well. Unfortunately, um, my field is not as developed as the field of physical health and epidemiology of war-related problems. And uh, I learned today that Les Roberts, who was formerly with the International Rescue Committee, will be here soon. Uh, there has been groundbreaking work and use with, with the use of epidemiological um, methodology for documenting uh, the mortality rates in, uh, due to um, war, particularly uh, for a good example would be in the, in the Congo and the, uh, do the documentation by IRC of um, millions of deaths during that uh, aftermath of that struggle. But in my field, in psychiatry, mental health, uh, it's very rudimentary because our measures uh, in mental health, one doesn't really know what to measure. The cultural meaning of trauma, the cultural meaning of symptoms, how one defines illness and disease, how one dis defines what's normal functioning, and how one quantifies it are all very, very difficult in, in, in uh, mental health and um, uh, psychosocial assessment. These numbers here are from multi-site uh, studies done by many different researchers, uh, both within the U.S. and outside of the U.S., including the World Health Organization. And you can see that both post-traumatic stress disorder and, de and depression are really common in the general population as, as far as diseases go, but you see this in huge difference, uh, this quantum difference in the uh, degree to which these disorders are found in refugee populations. But I'm not going to really focus on that too much, uh, but I wanted you to see the, the, the tremendous amount of what we could call psychopathology in refugee uh, populations. And the reason for, for my drawing attention to that is the social implications. Now the social effects of armed conflict have to do with the disruption of normal daily life, family relationships, community relationships, one's work life, cultural uh, activities. It also damages human values, calls into question the normal social order, which can be a good thing. And, uh, there's actually some benefit to looking behind the veil, so to speak, and, and uh, when societies question how they uh, have been ordered uh, in the past. Um, but the altered economic status is particularly important. If you have a population with levels of depression and post-traumatic stress disorder in the order of half, there are um, well-known studies that document the social dysfunction of people suffering from these disorders. Uh, it has a tremendous impact. So if you're talking about development, post-conflict development, economic development, social development, and you have that degree of depression and um, you have to, to then consider the degree of disability in the community that's responsible for rehabilitating uh, the community. So how does one approach understanding um, this business of psychosocial impact? And we've developed a model in this field of how to begin to address it. And if you think of a hierarchy of risk in the population of people in post-conflict settings, high risk, medium, and low risk, strong exposure uh, and severe psychological, psychological distress, less exposure and limited exposure, having uh, various levels of impact. I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about each level and I'm going to illustrate this sort of skiing over the surface just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, before I do that, I want, I, I want to sort of summarize what the factors are that influence the impact of trauma on a human being. Uh, these are risk factors, if you will. Uh, the severity, the duration uh, of the traumatic events. Carolyn pointed out that detention, well, what one could call detention in refugee camps goes on for decades. So uh, also, if one has been interred in a concentration camp or a prisoner of war setting, Etc. that has major implications. Age and developmental level, uh, genetic and biological vulnerabilities to developing mental disorders. And the interpretation of the events by the victim and their society are, are very important. 
The social context is something I can't overstate, and, and those of us in the medical community don't always think about this, but the meaning of what happens is really important to the individual. For example, uh, if you are a young uh, Somali girl and you are raped, uh, which is, was very common in that conflict, uh, that society uh, really views that young woman as damaged, impure, imperfect, and really not marriageable. It has lifelong co potential, lifelong consequences for her. On the other hand, say a Turkish political prisoner who is um, tortured during his uh, time in jail and is released. When he returns to the community, it's sort of, he has sort of a badge of honor that he has stood up to the, the authorities and uh, stood up for his own particular political view. The receiving environment treats those individuals very differently and will have major consequences when it comes to impact. And, some, and these other factors here, I'm not going to go into detail, but just to give you the broad brush strokes. So going back to the tip of the, of the pyramid, who are these people in the high risk groups? These are the seriously mentally ill, the people who are brain injured, epileptics, the mentally retarded, the people who develop serious mental illnesses. And these people may have had these illnesses in, the, in their regular life before the war, but brain injury uh, is extremely common during um, uh, conflict as well as during uh, circumstances of torture. It's estimated up to 35% of refugees have experienced torture, and that's why I included a, a little bit of the discussion of torture in this lecture, because uh, we don't want to forget that. Um, these are just some pictures to remind us of the, the, who these individuals are and where they're living. This is a health worker from, in an IRC program in Kakuma refugee camp with an <coughs> epileptic young man. This lady is psychotic and living in a refugee camp. This was back in the Cambodian camps. Um, there's no physical stigmata of her mental distress, but you have to look at the behavioral manifestations of uh, of the distress, and this makes the whole field of psychosocial and mental health so fuzzy because there's no real parameter we can put our fingers on. We have to take into consideration so many other levels of analysis. So that middle tier, the at-risk group, is huge, and unfortunately, we only have so impressionistic ideas of how large these various groups are, at-risk versus uh, high-risk, but this group is thought to be large. These are the people who have uh, witnessed or experienced atrocities. Family members have been killed. They have been, themselves have been raped or tortured. Former child soldiers, landmine victims, etc. Like the, just to give you some illustrations, such as this gentleman, uh, these young people who were abducted into the Lord's Resistance Army in northern Uganda, uh, former child soldiers, uh, war orphans, um, lower risk groups. This is the sort of the bottom end of the pyramid, who, the large numbers of people who are less affected. Uh, maybe their families weren't directly in affected, maybe they didn't lose uh, uh, loved ones, uh, less severe losses. But nevertheless, their lives have been uh, affected, obviously. For example, the whole community of Sarajevo was affected by the war. This is, is a picture of a hospital, actually, just to give you an idea of their infrastructure back in the 90s. So this is where I want to touch on just a few, just a minute or two on intervention, because this is a field I, I find people are not all that well informed, or at least to help you understand about how these programs are developed with our uh, understandings of the needs being as relatively crude as they are. Curative approaches are used for the high-risk groups. At-risk groups, we, use pr we try to use prevention, and low-risk groups are community-based prom health promotion types of activities, peace building, and that sort of thing. And I'll give you some illustrations. Individualized treatment makes curative programs very labor-intensive, expensive, and when you think of the millions of people affected by war, how do you justify using such uh, funding, f limited funding for mental health programs on the se most severely affected small numbers of people? I would have to say most of the funding is, goes to this middle level of prevention activities. This has to do with family tracing and reunification, reintegration of former child soldiers, uh, gender-based violence programs for rape victims and domestic violence, et cetera. But then there's the community-based programs that pr promote resiliency. 
promote, promote coping and peace building. I'm going to give you an illustration, some illustrations of each. My own program in Boston is a curative program. We treat, evalu we evaluate and treat asylum seekers, victims of trafficking, uh, refugees, um, uh, w people escaping um, uh, human rights abuses in their own country, uh, victims of female genital uh, cutting, etc. cetera. Uh, another example is one of my favorite programs, uh, also funded by IRC and the, via the Women's Commission, is Dr. Cynthia's clinic at the Burma border where I helped uh, a few couple of years ago uh, develop a mental health initiative. Unfortunately, it didn't uh, get, as, get as much funding as we had hoped, but this was integrating mental health into a primary care uh, center. And these young trainees now gra in their little graduation ceremony uh, uh, were able to have some um, introduction to mental health evaluation and treatment. I think the, the most famous mental health program for refugees is, was in, at what is in the Kakuma refugee camp uh, was recognized by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees years ago as being uh, the gold standard. Also a very important IRC program, maybe under-recognized for how significant it, significant it is. It's a curative program. Prevention programs aimed at reducing risk, promoting strength, restoring um, uh, normal cultural supportive mechanisms, and some examples. Uh, going back to northern Uganda again for former uh, child soldiers, many families had kids uh, continue to have children abducted uh, and forced to act as um, a soldiers, uh, sexual slaves, etc. And this is a group of parents that not only got together to offer one another emotional support, but develop a little agricultural project together so that they could um, have some money for returning children's educational needs, etc. That was also an IRC-funded program. The gender-based violence program, for example, in Sierra Leone, where the prevalence of rape is, was, extremely, is, was extremely high during their conflict. Dealing this little center is one of several dealing with uh, domestic violence, rape, women's empowerment in a culture, a culture where they really have very little power. Oops. And to give you some examples of what, are, what do I mean by mental health promotion, psychosocial promotion, these are peace building, community-based programs, skills development, sort of how do you get the community uh, back together, working together, cooperating, and move away to, from hatred and distrust that are common after uh, conflict. This is a project, uh, I, is, this is a fish pond the, that a community was funded by the RSC, again, to uh, develop a fish pond, not so much that they need, wanted to uh, develop an income source, which of course a fish pond does provide for the community, but building of the fish pond, stocking it, selling the fish, brought the community together as a sort of uh, peacemaking uh, activity. A uh, befriending program I uh, w was involved with uh, short, for a short time in Northern Ireland, where people affected by the troubles on both sides worked together with families who had lost family members. It was a peace-promoting, peace-building activity. One tries to normalize uh, uh, the environment where families, children live. This is a revitalizing culture in one of the camps. And the bottom line is to restore hope and, uh, in any kind of uh, intervention project. So thank you. That's it. I'm a low-tech guy in a high-tech world. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Our final speaker for the day is Dr. Sharon McDonald. She received her MD degree in 1985 from the University of California at San Diego. She also received a master's in public health from Johns Hopkins University in 1993. Among her many appointments, she is currently adjunct associate professor of community and family medicine at Dartmouth Medical School. Additionally, she works as a medical epidemiologist for the Vermont Department of Health. Previously, she worked as the chief of the data for decision making and public health training branch in the division of international health at the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia. 
In this role, she served as the CDC's focal point for international epidemiology and public health training for national and subnational health staff in over 35 countries. Her work involved creating tools for assessment, planning, and integration of health information systems. This included long-term involvement with the implementation and evaluation of infectious disease, injury, and mortality information systems. In 1999, 2000, and 2001, she received the CDC Award for Contributions in International Health. In addition to her active role in public health and epidemiology, she has published over 50 articles in healthcare and related fields. Please welcome Dr. McDonald. Oh, good afternoon. Let's see if I can get in a position with this. But this is it, huh? Well, I have to tell a story about myself, which is that I was invited to come give this talk tomorrow. <laughs> and um, at 5 o'clock this morning, uh, we figured out that it's today. And so I'm actually fairly pleased that we have most of the parts here and uh, that all of my family and everyone was able to sort of relax around that and figure it out. Anyway, it's always a kind of a, that, that'll be a story that'll be more fun later. Uh, have, uh, have some of you been to war? Have some of you been to war? Maybe spent two or three months in a war. Yeah, maybe a lot longer. Um, I mention it, I mean, certainly one thing is that war is a really different place. Um, and I had the um, opportunity to work in the Afghanistan uh, Soviet war during the late 80s and I learned some things about war. One is that the opposite of war really isn't peace and that war is really easy to start and nearly impossible to stop and that there is no such thing as start and stop. That, that war just sort of happens. It, enough things collapse or slide until there it is and the the reality, there's a new reality, and that reality, um, the rules of that reality are not civil, and the human cost of war is our humanity, and our health is indeed part of that. I would like to say that um, Hannah Arendt, back in the 70s, and musing about the Vietnam War, said something that I think is uh, important. Um, she argued that when political power begins to collapse, the temptation to commit violent acts increases. The antithesis, or the opposite of violence, is not peace, but power. And I think that that is a very key aspect to thinking about how we work with war. Um, war is one of those topics that we used to talk about only in terms of combatants, certainly in health. Uh, we um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, we did some surveys of the health of the United States and, the, and found out we weren't very healthy and that we, didn't, we could, in fact, not mount an army to protect ourselves. So prior to World War I and uh, later, we did a lot of things to make sure that our population was healthier, in part um, motivated by trying to get our basic population and, and our self-defense in better shape. One of the issues, I think, is, well, it's really, um, since the 1990s, we have started to talk about war in different ways, rather than how can we keep combatants healthy, and oh, what a terrible thing, it's a war, there's nothing we can do, as was implied that, well, in war, we don't do programs. Well, now, since the 1990s, we have been doing programs, and what we've learned is it's really hard and, and, and sometimes it's not really smart. And uh, we've tried to get a lot better about doing that and at the same time perhaps have an impact on the context in which we work. But war is indeed bad for your health. Uh, the real question is, are we going to think about it in a, in like as a public health issue, which is, in a sense, is it preventable? Are there ways to look at it in which we can start to think about the root problems? Um, First, I guess, is from the physical aspects of health, health is defined by the World Health Organization as the complete 
physical, mental, and social well-being. It's not the absence of disease or infirmity. It's pretty open. Uh, so what makes people healthy? Well, that's when we talk about determinants of health. And determinants of health, as they're defined here by Canada, in fact, it's a spectrum of factors and their interactions known to influence and contribute to health. So health includes politics, societal, economic, and physical environments, early childhood development, personal health practices, individual capacity, coping skills, biology, and perhaps least of all, health services, the one we think of as most associated. War is, in fact, one of the critical determinants in the health status of many populations. And it involves a cyclic interaction of triggers or predisposing events. And hopefully, everybody got one of these little pieces of paper. This is, I don't know if any of our students are here from the Masters of Public Health program, but one of the things we try to get people to do are logic <laughs> models, to think about what things influence other things. And if we look at this, to an extent, we start that there are predisposing events that, that, per, that perpetuate and encourage the use of violence and the solution of war, because war is to solve some problem. And those predisposing events, in fact, uh, usually are a cyclic interaction of uh, poverty, underlying disparities, uh, famine, uh, la lack of power, injustice. And then we get talking about what we call complex humanitarian disaster, where we get war plus an earthquake, war plus a famine, that kind of thing. Uh, and in that sense, then, every one of the determinants of health that we talked about is much worse in the context of war. So as we look at this, in a sense, the predisposing events that then lead into war, we get up at the top the, um, the destruction of infrastructure. We don't have roads and communication. <coughs> Right below that, violence, then leading to morbidity and mortality. Displacements, which leads to enormous shifts of population, uh, which uh, we will see in a minute. Um, but people end up being placed in camps uh, for their safety and for the ease of logistics and delivering certain kinds of services. And within these large camps, certain health risks um, are attendant. There is a loss of production. Um, loss of purchasing power and destruction of commercial networks. And at the same time, a great deal of the funding and resources and energy is reallocated to the, uh, to the uh, priority of defense. So we end up with economic crises, the reduction of state budgets for health. We lose our health workers, our health facilities are attacked, hospitals are not safe. Um, nor are they staffed, nor do they have the materials that they need to do what they need to do. And to the extent that then, when relief is coming in, uh, it's uh, quite an uphill battle, and um, it is working very far down the chain. So the violent 20, 20th century, during um, 1900 and 1995, it was estimated there were about 110 million deaths in the 255 wars. There are people that count them, and we could argue the case definition. About 25 million deaths just since um, 1945, since World War II, in the 170 wars since that time. It's estimated there are about 95 active conflict or wars going on now. Um, and the, certainly, the um, mortality and morbidity is just a small amount of actually what happens to people. I think we did make the, the point was made earlier that uh, some of the changes in war has been that um, it's, most of the conflict now is internal conflict. And people don't wear uniforms. And there aren't soldiers. And in fact, com the combatant, the civilian plays a very different role. Uh, they're targets. And they are, um, in fact, dying at increasing rates. Um, at the bottom here, we see in the trends of civilian casualties, in the Battle of Gettysburg, there was recorded one, per one civilian that died. And with every war since then, the proportion of civilians who are, in fact, the, uh, the, um, in the burden of morbidity and mortality, and in this case, mortality, is, increases. So that 90% or nine civilians die for every soldier. Of the war deaths, 
50 to 80 percent of them are women and children. Um, getting rid of the idea, I guess, again, that there are soldiers and men that go out and fight. These are not women soldiers. Uh, more children die in conflict than soldiers, and about 1.3 men die for every one woman. Disability is then um, usually some factor um, much, much larger. Uh, according to the global burden of disease calculated by the World Health Organization, which can only at best be considered an underestimate, war uh, in 1990 ranked 16th in terms of disability um, adjust adjusted life years. In 2020, it's likely that it will rank eighth. The long-term costs of conflict, we get to not only then we take away the health services. So war deprives people of health and public health. Vaccinations, routine services they're going to get. In fact, in one study, um, people were three times more likely to die of tuberculosis in a war setting. Um, many of these diseases take a lot of continuity, um, a lot of care, and that is not possible in uh, this situation. And as I said, chronic conflict is self-perpetuating. It lasts for generations as populations acculturate to violence. And all of the variables that lead to stable populations, education, economic stability, um, governmental stability, become impossible. So there's a long recovery phase. Um, briefly, when we talk about the trigger events, there are some kinds of trigger events where there's been unrest, disparities, Things are not, are not well, but they are in control, or they are at least not actively violent. Then there's a famine or there's a war. Something triggers and the situation collapses. At that point, uh, there are a certain number of deaths just simply due to the conflict. And what we get then is the population displacement, which can be enormous, migration of a population. And that is, by the United Nations, um, definitions a group called people of concern or uprooted. Um, I think one of the other speakers, uh, we've, we've tried to, uh, all I can say about these numbers is that give or take a couple million on any one of them, but uh, needless to say, these are people not aiming to be counted, but perhaps one out of every 220 to 300 persons in the world is considered a person of concern, uprooted. And those divide then into internally displaced, a very large group of people that no programs are usually working with, refugees, asylum seekers, and other stateless persons. Um, and then we get to the sort of chronic emergency phase, as people have talked about, where a refugee situation then, um, such as Tibet, Pakistan, um, it goes on for years. In this phase, this is the population displacement phase. These are people like us who suddenly got the message, run. And it's, um, it's like this. You use your wheelbarrows and your wagons, and you take what you can carry. And uh, we're not very good at it. We're not very good at living in the camps that are then created to handle um, places uh, where the many of us then go to sit down one of the things that has been learned is that the care in these situations, we've gotten better at it. Um, uh, Les Roberts and other folks from IRC, one of the things that was documented was that the kinds of care given in these situations can make an enormous difference to the kinds of mortality rates that are seen. In the acute disaster setting with population migration, such as Darfur, Goma, and the Kurds, um, anywhere from 10 to 80 percent of the uprooted population will die in transit. And that depends, of course, the very young, the very old. There may or may not be water along the way. They may be shot at. There are lots of conditions. So it's a very dangerous trip. When we, people are collected into camps, the um, mortality rates are measured um, on a daily rate, unlike here where we do it per year. And usually they're 60 times higher than they are in non-refugee populations. The leading causes of death are malnutrition, diarrheal diseases, measles, acute respiratory infections, and malaria, all of which interact with each other to make, it, uh, to make each one of them worse. So in the uprooted situations, whether um, in the best situation, perhaps, a person's in a refugee camp and getting services, although they are very crowded then together, and that has its, its uh, um, problems. There's lack of food and fuel. 
uh, lack of clean water and sanitation. I don't know if people remember with the Kurds where we were dropping water from airplanes onto the mountains and, uh, and, and trying to drop food, and it was incredibly difficult. Uh, shelter, insufficient and unsafe shelter, uh, that's certainly an issue. Um, lack of public health services and medical care, uh, violence, uh, threats, torture and rape. I, I don't know that we see more, that there is more of it than there was in the days of Alexander, but it is certainly finally getting talked about. People are remembering to ask about it um, and trying to do some programs to address it. The stress and loss, uh, basically a person's worldview is completely shattered and their, their coping mechanisms don't work. So the psychological and emotional problems um, is sort of like what's a normal response to seeing your entire family die? I, I don't know, but that one does expect uh, stress. Um, I wanted to just illustrate this with the HIV AIDS um, and population displacement in Africa. Africa is the center of many conflicts right now. The epidemic uh, certainly um, increases uh, many of the donor agencies, World Bank and others, the United States putting a lot of money in because the destabilization of the societies of Africa is of great concern. And if one out of three people are in fact ill and dying, uh, the society begins to lose its ability to hold itself together and is more susceptible to violence and destabilization. Displaced populations are at increased risk of contracting AIDS, and as a result, that has changes in social structures. Displaced persons with HIV AIDS are at increased risk of infectious diseases and malnutrition, and they're less likely to be given the care um, for those diseases and then are more likely to die because of them and to spread them to other people. Um, and then finally, the perpetuation of violence and lack of support to stabilizing elements such as education con and conflict. One of the things that, um, so on the hopeful note, one of the um, issues that's emerged out of the 1990s has been, are there, we, we understand that war is not good for your health, is health good for peace? Or are there things, in fact, ways of looking at what happens in societies in which health is one of the determinants or contributors to um, stabilization that may, in fact, be important? Um, I'd like to just read um, from the WHO. In 1998, the strategy was developed by WHO called Health uh, as a Bridge for Peace, and actions uh, refer to efforts by health-oriented organizations and health professionals that are consciously designed to both improve public health, such as surveillance, um, response to diseases, water, sanitation, nutrition, and medical services, and contribute to promoting peace and or reducing conflict. A particular subset of Health for Peace actions, known as Health as a Bridge for Peace, refers to an approach to second track diplomacy uh, conceived of by the um, Pan American Health Organization and adopted by the World Health Organization. Uh, the concept is that there may be some shared concerns across a conflict and there may be actions that can be taken. Fundamental issues of health can pro provide an entry point for um, negotiation. Conflicting parties may be willing to agree on certain objectives uh, that transcend their uh, conflicts and provide a nexus for dialogue and action. And a few examples of this, probably the most well-known, uh, came from what are called the uh, ceasefire days or for vaccination or days of tranquility. And, um, and for example, in Sudan, where then the war, was agreements were made on all sides to stop the war for four days or longer and let the children be reached on all sides of the conflict and provide vaccination. It does raise the question, well, if you can stop it for four days, why don't you stop it for four months uh, or four years? But that is, we, not, we're not there yet. Um, other programs that have taken advantage of this kind of leverage was the uh, guinea worm eradication program by the Carter uh, Center. Um, and were able, by using uh, the, cease, the, the guinea worm ceasefire to leverage their way into communities that were completely inaccessible due to the war. Um, health workers have played roles in peacekeeping operations um, and in 
being allowed to take uh, certain parts of the population and protect them. The uh, use of epidemiology and other kinds of information to look at issues like landmines ultimately resulted in banning of landmines by most countries and the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, the joint planning of health programs, for example, when I worked in Afghanistan, the donors demanded that both sides of the conflict sit down together and make some core definitions about what is a health facility, what is a doctor, what are the essential drugs, and that began some dialogues that um, at least uh, certain elements could then be standardized and provided. Donor demanding standards and cooperation uh, began to see that the local leaders, what they called the commanders or, they, or the media calls the warlords, began to see that it was in their benefit to have services to provide to their populations. Just briefly, I want to talk about the fact that um, in looking at war um, as a determinant of health, one of the issues is to take and look at the components, the sort of the phases. and vulnerability reduction. What can we do to reduce the potential for violence to occur in societies? Uh, early warning. There are lots of early warning systems that have been tried in, the, in um, famine um, systems looking at food shortages. And there, it's been suggested that similar types of things where you see people behaving differently, selling things, moving in different ways. These are the, perhaps the newest areas that are under consideration. Um, bolstering resilience is another um, of trying to make sure that the systems can function in all kinds of settings. Mitigation, um, the appropriate assessment and reduction of violence and instability is the area where um, certainly humanitarian relief has been uh, most active. And then the rehabilitation reform, certainly uh, many programs have realized that they were there for relief and disaster for war and then as things perhaps began to settle down, that they had to look at it as a development opportunity and perhaps put in a new kind of system that worked a bit better. I, it turns out that this is controversial, whether or not there is a role for health workers in peace, and there is a certain aspect of that that makes sense. Um, on the pro side, certainly it may be that health programs can displace conflict or distract from it. Health workers do have a unique access to policymakers and the public, and uh, a chance to speak um, at a much larger to speak to a much larger audience, and um, to take advantage of that uh, bully pulpit. Uh, gathering credible information can influence public opinion and instigate political change. And that the scale of the problem really does call for innovation and perhaps reconceiving our roles as health workers, um, as peacemakers. On the other side. Um, these are all well, argument, uh, well argued in uh, JAMA and Lancet and other uh, papers that uh, scientists are not diplomatic band-aids, they're not mini diplomats or soldiers, and putting them into situations in which you don't have a framework of uh, policy and um, clear uh, uh, programmatic efforts for uh, setting up uh, the stability for the society may not make sense. It may just be one doctor running around in a war zone. Uh, dilute the scientific work is poor quality science might be probable. I think that there has, in fact, been some very good quality science. I think it behooves the relief community to demand of donors, though, that the evaluation of all the work does get done and that we don't keep doing the same thing over and over again. Um, the concern is that we might compromise our perception of objectivity. Um, or that our information may be used in the wrong way. That, for example, uh, the very nice census data that we collect then might be used by the government to, in fact, know where the young boys are, that they can be collected and then recruited through the draft. And that was certainly a concern in Colombia. Um, and that we don't have a lot of experience with the best methods. So uh, I think that, um, certainly from my opinion, we should try to gain that experience. Thank you. Well, I'm going to exercise the chair's prerogative. Um, one of the remarks in Dr. McDonald's uh, talk really struck me. She said, the antithesis of war 
is not peace, but power. It occurred to me that historically, unconstrained power has been a dangerous thing for people in many states all around the world. And so it's always, it always brings to mind the question, is war always the worst option? I mean, people talk wistfully about the Great War, the Good War, the Civil War, which implies anyways that there are irrelevant wars, bad wars, or uncivil wars. And so I was wondering if it's fair to say from a public health perspective anyways, that war is always an unalloyed bad. And that's for anybody that wants to. I, I, I would like to just sort of take a stab at, and the first experience I'm gonna draw from is as a parent. And sometimes you have to stop people from doing bad things. Um, I don't know how we do that at an international level, and I think that's one of the things that many countries in the UN struggle with is when something really awful is happening to people, what can we do, and is, is it war, or are there other things? Um, speaking as a Quaker, um, speaking as a public health practitioner, I think there are a lot of things before war that uh, don't get taken up. Uh, they're, they're harder in some ways. We don't have uh, large budgets going into the prevention of war. We have war budgets. And so the, uh, it's, the, it's an easy thing to grab, just like uh, I tell my son not to pick up the stick. So I, 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 you know, there are, there are some nice uh, literature on World War II, which was considered one of the good wars, about some of the efforts that were made to prevent that, that I think are worth visiting again to think, well, were there things much earlier that could have been done, um, and can we get better at that? Yeah, I, I'm going to duck that when I was making it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you answered. Yeah, I don't know if there's anything I can say about whether there's ever a good war. I don't feel qualified to say anything about that, but I touched on in my talk about uh, the opportunity for re-examining a, a society's values when a war occurs and social change that can take place as a result of that war can be good, but I think that doesn't justify necessarily the war. In the back, and then we'll come back this way. Yeah, I have a, a quick question. Sort of, as there are sort of uh, <coughs> thoughts about sort of uh, targeting civilians of change and sort of this increased awareness of sort of public health, why don't we hear more debates about sort of what, basically when we're talking about intervening into situations, why don't we hear more discussion sort of about these public health factors? Or given that sort of the civilian is playing sort of a larger role in our imagination, why is it the case that most deaths are now sort of civilian deaths? It just seems like this fundamental disconnect, we're sort of progressing with all of this information available to us, sort of about public health, but yet we see that the people who still suffer the most from these conflicts are still women and children, sort of almost regardless of the increased awareness that we have about these issues. So I was wondering, sort of, as, as sort of practitioners, where do you see that disconnect happening? Um, power, who controls the flow of information, what sort of information is uh, interesting to the general public, but uh, is, is a hunch that I have, maybe you have a comment? Well, I think there were a number of questions in, in your question, if you know what I mean. I, I think probably, I think your slide showed um, that conflicts are more likely to be internal now. Um, and and I, I think that's probably a reason, one reason why um, it involves non-combatants more. Um, and often, I mean, like now in Nepal, for example, um, different sides will um, try to, you know, terrify the population into providing information. Um, I mean, I just think it's very, a very different kind of violence from um, times when countries attacked each other. Um, now it seems as though sucking the, the civilian population into the conflict is, is part of the way of trying to win the war. Um, and even recruiting children to be, to be soldiers themselves. Mm -hmm. I also, um, the studies on looking at public health, looking at war and conflict as a public health problem was really proposed by Mike Toole and Ron Waldman and other folks, and these are papers from the 1990s, 
and that's not, in the world of medicine and health and social policy, it's not a very long time. And we do, we have changed. We now, for example, with Iraq, we send a team of public health workers to go and while we're busy, you know, bombing from the sky, we go along and count and see the effect of how many health facilities are available and how many doctors and, and what health programs need to be put in place. So it's a little odd, but it, uh, it, it, they're both happening. Gentlemen, uh, a couple of the speakers mentioned uh, uh, Les Roberts, and Les is going to be speaking here next Monday in Chilcot Auditorium at 12:15. Les is a very distinguished international epidemiologist who has really done some seminal studies on the mortality uh, in the Congo. And what he did was go into uh, very difficult areas and do creditable epidemiological surveys of <coughs> mortality, not, not combat mortality, but overall mortality. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but they're astounding. And uh, he has done a similar study in Iraq, which he's going to talk about next Monday. And. Um, as an outgrowth of less studies, uh, well, those studies have been used for advocacy, uh, for uh, testifying before Congress to try to uh, use them to make a political impact. And I would urge you to come here, Les. I think you may have told me that he was one of the best teachers you've ever had. Yeah. Here. Uh -huh. I think that the, the studies We have, um, I mean, one of the things that happens is that our urge to do something really pulls us. And so we want to do something. And I think from the military parlance, you, you always are fighting the last war. Uh, in relief, we're always relieving the last disaster or the last setting. And so to some extent, and there's very little front end work on uh, the ethnographic, um, other sorts of issues around who are these people and maybe it wouldn't be good to deliver pork or maybe they don't need X, Y, or Z. And so to some extent really pushing that getting you know, quick, do nothing, look, assess first, and at the other end stop and see if something worked. And we don't have, I think, I think that's one of the things where we need to work a lot harder to get the message out that great, you did something, see if it worked, what, you know, and begin to see what variables made a difference. I, uh, I noticed that your, your uh, dissertation about the uh, wars going on left out the United States. It's saying that life is cheap every place else, but it isn't saying that life is cheap here, which it is. And from uh, Andy Rooney's 86 predictions, we've got uh, uh, just short of 80 million people killed in drug wars in the United States. I know some kids in, home, in Hanover who have no mom, no dad, no home. They're 16, 17 years old, right? You talk about home in some place else, you get it here. And uh, uh, the almost 80 million people that have been killed in the drug wars, they get a mom and dad, but let's a minimum of 60 million people upset about it. Also, uh, thank you. Is, I was wondering, maybe you could talk a little bit about the comparison in these similar types of public health issues in the United States with the kinds of public health issues in some of these other places that we see in Africa or elsewhere that you've talked about? Different address. Different address. Um, well, you know, we have them. We do call them wars. Um, I don't know uh, strategically if we go about it all the same way. Um, but. It get, and I think that's where, in looking at things as a public health um, problem and saying, all right, what are the root causes here? Um, disparities, you know, disparities in power, disparities in resources, uh, and, and trying to look at, now, now what we're not so good at is fixing those problems. Um, how do we make sure that certain educational things are available? The United States has a, a particular view about core services for every individual that is different than other societies. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, and it's being played out in a big way in our health services right now. 
Well, I can also say uh, if you want to keep things local, domestically, the issue of resettled refugees uh, is pertinent to what you're illustrating. When, when uh, even, even though resettlement is not a major solution, it's not, it is one of the durable solutions for refugee uh, displacement globally. But when refugees are resettled, even though uh, all the best efforts are made, they're resettled into the worst neighborhoods, the lowest income apartments where there's drugs and gangs, and the children in those families uh, enter into the street culture and become uh, some of the casualties that you're talking about. So there's a, a direct uh, crossover. Uh, this, the, 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 the continued disenfranchisement, this marginalization of people in the U.S. that are resource poor on the outskirts and uh, don't receive enough attention. In the late 1980s, when refugee resettlement was probably at its peak in the late 80s and early 90s, when we had over 100,000 refugees coming into the country, uh, resettlement services such as cash and medical assistance, basically welfare, was available to these people for three years. Then it was scaled back in the uh, mid-90s to one year. Then in the later 90s, it was scaled back to eight months. Now, it's four months of cash and medical assistance, and that's it for resettled refugees. So it's, it's dire straits for people who are coming here, and they, they are then entered, entering into this cultural group that you're talking about that have the, the fewest resources, and they can't speak English. They oftentimes have problems with illiteracy, and I'll give you an example. The Somali Bantu population coming into the U.S. now, and New Hampshire is a resettlement state. The illiteracy rate is 90 percent. It's huge, and many, many of the families are female-headed households. Um, in New Hampshire, last week, uh, our own um, uh, Richard Waddell hosted a conference at the New Hampshire Health Department where we specifically talked about this. In our own state, we have 6,000 refugees in the state of New Hampshire. In Vermont, um, somewhat less, maybe 4,000. But uh, we're bringing in large number, well, for our little state, a couple of hundred people, 300 people a year. And we haven't thought this through. Now we have problems in Manchester with lead paint poisoning and uh, children, a uh, large number of kids in the Somali Bantu community have lead paint poisoning. It's a big problem. And where are they living? In these neighborhoods you're talking about. Not that the resettlement agencies are doing a bad job. They're wonderful groups. It's that they don't have the resources uh, to um, offer them. Nor and, and I always have to say, just because it's policy, this is because this is our uh, 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 policy from the federal government for four months of assistance doesn't mean it's right. It's completely wrong and it's not working. So we'll have more casualties in that uh, up ahead. Could I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Of my sort of co um, do What do we know about the long-term effects, say, of um, um, like the Rwanda conflict or, say, Northern Ireland? Well, I mean, I, I'm asking because I genuinely just don't know the literature at all. Do, do we know anything about the long-term effects of either that, the, the sort of cataclysm in Rwanda that just affected everybody? I mean, I worked there afterwards, and I just thought, how do people manage to, to do anything, in a way, after what they've experienced? Or in Northern Ireland, where it's just the length of time for which it's gone on. Do we know anything about... Um, well, how people one, sort of one of the, the pl places where you can begin to look at this is, I think, is Cambodia, because uh, Cambodia's genocide was uh, in the 1970s, and we had a lot of sort of a lot of health-related and public health, mental health-related studies in the camps before resettlement, uh, repatriation, and there is work being done in this. Although I can't say that I know the yes, answers yeah. to it, but. Look at Cambodian society, it has a lot of problems now, uh, as well as good things. But I think looking at, at societies like that who ha are struggling to put themselves back together would be a good place to begin. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you know something? Well, I think um, I had to recently write a paper on some of these topics, and one of the reviewers, you know, the hypothesis that um, a society, that violence um, perpetuates violence, was considered hypothetical and unsupported by the literature, and that um, 
if that's something that we need to study to find out that, in fact, if all of our children see war and violent solutions and they don't go to school and they don't have any hope, uh, would that increase the likelihood that they also choose violent solutions and don't make stable societies? Then I think so. There is some literature from the Holocaust, uh, uh, the, the sort of the second generation, the children of Holocaust survivors, that suggests that this sort of traumatic uh, insult is communicated between the generations. But uh, I don't think there's enough solid um, yeah. scientific yeah. information yet. Thank you. In the back, and then we'll come to you. Yeah. Um, I was wondering that uh, uh, in uh, Professor McDonald's uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, scientists or, or doctors as uh, trying to negotiate ceasefires and uh, or you know trying to uh, deliver medical services during times of war and or in uh, violent situations, um, how uh, receptive are uh, are you our governments or, or you know um, combatant groups uh, to uh, to these kind of suggestions usually and uh, you know how, uh, how often do they work well I don't know how often it does or doesn't work but I, I've had some experience with it and uh, to some extent um, everybody who wants to be in power wants to be seen as giving services and to the extent that we can take those services, out of the hands of one party or another, or make them equitably distributed, uh, it helps. Whether that's an outbreak investigation, for example, we in the Philippines, uh, we were, they did not want us investigating an outbreak in various parts of the country without armed guards from the government. And I mean, that, just from simple things like that, of saying, well, no, what, what we're going to need to do is not have that kind of obvious association. Um, it's, um, I've done it more in the context of, you know, what are the key, the core features of health. Um, I think that nobody wants the doctors to be acting like politicians and pretending to be politicians, but they do understand that these are scientists, they're seen as objective and they're respected. And I think using that respect in a, in a good way uh, is, is actually, particularly when you have data, you know, and that's where studies from the, on the field about, you know, this many people are dying, this is what they're dying of, they're much more, it's much more motivating than to look like, in fact, a political ploy. We have time for one more question from a student. <laughs> I have a question. Have a chance later. I have a question about uh, the, uh, you, about the uh, work of aid groups, third party aid groups in terms of conflict. When there's so many conflicts taking place throughout the world at the same time, how effective are third party groups in bringing aid to those conflicts? And what's the kind of prioritization process that takes place in choosing where to focus the majority of that aid? It's only money. Um, I, I will speak in behalf of the non governmental agencies because in conflict, one of the things that happens, for example, I worked with the World Health Organization, and until uh, very late in the 1980s, the UN had no capacity to work in conflict, or especially in an internal conflict, because the UN was member governments. And so the Su Sudan wasn't going to come and ta ask for help for their, the people that they considered the bad guys within their government. So, there were not many agencies that could move, except for the non-governmental agencies. And, um, you know, however, there are many of them. And so in certain situations, and I think um, Goma and, and various situations where it really came out where, you know, 500 agencies responding to um, a situation, all doing it differently, uh, perhaps all doing it like you do it at Dartmouth, but not how you should probably do it in Rwanda was a very big um, lesson out of that. And many agencies, or, uh, projects were formed to in fact coordinate and work with the non-governmental agencies to uh, start thinking about, well, not everybody can do the sexy surgery, somebody's got to dig with the latrines, the, the, the ways, the standards for doing this should be the drugs that are available. And, and really, there's been a lot of work trying to do that. But 
there you can get money for some places so much more easily than others, and that has to do with the politics and you know. Well, that's what I was going to bring up. I mean, maybe Dr. Strickler could say something if he wants to about. USAID, the State Department, and where we allocate our funds, non-governmental organizations accept money and t large amounts of money from the State Department through USAID, and um, that also helps with prioritizing. You know what you can get money to spend uh, on various projects. There'll be a call for uh, a response. So I don't know if that's well, fair. Uh, maybe the last word on that, particularly USAID, ought to be. Uh, Ambassador Yalowitz, he probably knows uh, AID far, far better than I do. Well, I don't want to comment on that, but uh, I just want to make one other observation uh, from my own experience, and that is that uh, one of the reasons that a lot of these internal conflicts go on a long time uh, is that whatever motivated the warring parties to begin it, uh, what happens is that uh, the vested interests who have a stake continuing the conflict because they've often organized the risk of trade across these fire lines uh, and there's an awful lot of complicity on both sides to keep conflicts going. And I think this is something that is not always well understood. Uh, but as I said, we talked about you know, the admirable efforts to try to get people to realize you know, that they both have a stake in delivering you know, health care to, to people on both sides. Often they couldn't care less. Well, thank you all for coming and thanks to our panel.